Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Currency of Anarchy. I'm Josh Davis. Uh, if you'd like to be a part of the conversation during the live taping, please check us out at youtube.com slash users slash Anarchy on Mondays at 9 p.m., 6 p.m. Pacific. And you can see the final product on the same channel, youtube.com slash users slash Anarchy on Wednesdays at 3 p.m. And please check out our Facebook page at facebook.com slash Anarchy. If you're here during the live taping, please post any questions and comments to the new thread we've made, or send us a Facebook message and we'll certainly get to it. And now a word from our sponsors. Holly Cogburn runs Homebody, a body care, vanity, and cosmetic products company. She contracts using USD, Bitcoin, and barter. She is proud to say that she started the business without the assistance of bank loans. In her words, fuck bank loans and fuck their interest rates. For the most part, fuck banks. She has paid her startup costs out of pocket and has steadily and sustainably grown from there. She believes in a free, fair, and reputation-based market, relying on word of mouth. So please, find Holly at homebodyco.com or facebook.com slash homebodyco. All right, so uh, tonight we have Lauren Rumpler. Um, I don't know if you want to go by Objectivist Girl anymore. Uh, what is your name now? <laughs> My name. <laughs> yeah, what's your name? <laughs> is everyone confused as to what my name is? I I might be. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my real name is Lauren Rumpler. Um, yeah. I tried to kind of keep that under wraps when I first started, and that lasted all of three weeks. Um, when I realized that I'd signed up for a, my Objectivist Girl uh, new Gmail, because you have to get a Gmail in order to get a YouTube channel. And so I'd signed up for my new Gmail and put Lauren as my name. Um, and so, you know, my full name was broad broadcast the whole world because it said Lauren Ruffler right on my channel. That's so, it. You know, so I was like, oh, geez. And so, you know, I changed my Facebook name so that I could change my page um, to Lauren Rumpler, my real name, um, so that it would be not as confusing for people because, you know, a lot of people <laughs> would go to my Facebook page and then be like, yeah, every time that I try to go to your, you know, your regular page, your page, I end up going to your Facebook page. It's really annoying. Can you at least change your profile picture? I'm like, but I like that profile picture. <laughs> And so, um, you know, I want to use it for both. And so, <laughs> see, I did change it. I'm not going to announce on air what I'm using as my last name. Um, right. But I will tell you that um, it is my middle name. So yes. that's all I'll tell you. Okay, um, fair and if you can guess that, then kudos to you, and you can be my friend. <laughs> because they're, they're clearly very smart. But anyway... <laughs> The point is, is that no, I'm not going by Objectivist Girl. Objectivist Girl was a personality that I created, um, and I wanted her to be the perfect, the ideal objectivist. And so um, I wanted to separate it from my personal life um, because I never have been fully and completely objectivist. Uh, there are a lot of things about me that are, you know, I make mistakes, I do very unobjectivist things, and there's the fact that I'm not 100% fully and completely committed to objectivism. There's other things that I think that aren't objectivism, so. Right. Um, yeah, first, I guess, um, I, I guess I just want to firstly go over uh, the differences, maybe, between objectivism and subjectivism, and, I mean, um, I also know that we could be getting into Eastern philosophy later in the show, um, but I just want to go over this simple uh, difference, or at least, you know, the way you see it, I guess. Right. Um, yeah, go ahead. 
I think that's a great question. So um, a lot of people ask me about the difference between objectivism and subjectivism. And I did cover this in one of my ep episodes. I also talked about intrinsicism, which is very important to mention intrinsicism in order to be able to discuss this. So um, intrinsicism is what a lot of people think objectivism is. Um, mm. Intrinsicism is the idea that values um, are, ha are already existent before our existence. So they existed before us, they exist outside of us. They're not knowable um, per se uh, because of the fact that they haven't um, been really integrated through reality. They're just something outside, something arbitrary. And so um, actually what this is, is the justification for a higher power. Um, either a god or the state. So God is, um, you know, knows all the rules and is, you know, conferring it to us and we're supposed to follow that. Or it's the state which is all knowing and all powerful. And um, so they have a right to do things because they create the moral code and they are the arbiters of the moral code. And so it's this idea that moral code is outside of reality, um, outside of the common man. Um, but also, uh, the idea of objectivism is often confused with this. So, uh, but first I'm going to talk about subjectivism because I want to get the ones that aren't right out of the way. So, objectivism or subjectivism is about the idea that you are basing your opinions on whim, uh, faith, or um, opinion. So. You know, you're basing your all of your ideas based on these things, and that's subjective. So a lot of people say, I have certain preferences, I have, you know, I'm an individual human being, so subjective, like everything must be subjective It's because it's subject to me. And I'm like, no, it's not subject to you. So reality doesn't change because of what you want or what you need, it's based on rules and principles. And so if you discover those rules and principles, then you are looking at objective reality. And so that's why we call it objectivism, because it's the idea that the moral code is woven into the fabric of our existence and of nature and of all those other things. And it comes down to the saying, nature in order to be commanded must be obeyed. Now, you can live based on subjectivism, that's fine, but A, what kind of life are you living and how long are you going to exist? It's mm -hmm. about living a quality, happy life when you follow objectivism. So, I mean, you can follow objectivist principles, you can follow intrinsic pr principles if you want, but they're wrong and they're not going to lead to any sort of healthy, happy life. It's about <coughs> um, discovering reality and basing your decisions based on that. Right, yeah. I um... The idea of subjectivism is you're saying that your perception is your reality. And in a sense, that's true. It's just the fact that you need to align your perceptions to reality in order to be objective and to coexist with everyone peacefully, I suppose. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So um, let's um, move on to... Uh, Eastern philosophy. I mean, uh, I guess you're trying to, or talk about your new channel. You're starting a new project and all this. On, let's get into that first. So um, my new channel is. I'm so excited because <laughs> they're going to be able to see the core of what makes Lauren Rumpler. So I've been playing this perfect objectivist for a while, and it, it's been fun, and it's a little part of me, yes, I mean, it wasn't somebody I was faking, that is a little part of my personality, but what's cool is that with Lauren, I can kind of open Pandora's box and let everybody kind of, you know, take a look at exactly what I think, and also what I'm learning. So one of the things, one of the reasons that I decided to stop doing Objectivist Girl was really because I realized that I wasn't living as an objectivist by doing Objectivist Girl, um, because of the fact that I felt like I wasn't learning the things that I wanted to learn and pursuing the things that I wanted to pursue. And so at first I went into the channel thinking, you know, I really want to teach people things. I want the world to be more objectivist. 
and I'm glad that I accomplished that, you know, was able to help accomplish that goal. And I think that the speech I'll be giving in Anarchopolco about business ethics and the rest of the eight virtues will put all of objectivism out there. But I don't want to continue to talk about it because I feel like there's just so much more that I would like to learn and explore. And I'm spending so much time writing scripts for stuff that I already know. Right. Um, and I would prefer to take some time, read a new book, and then talk about it. Um, because for me, as an individual, my most important thing is the pursuit of knowledge. And so I'm more fascinated and interested in, than, in the pursuit of knowledge than anything else in the whole world. I would rather pursue knowledge than hang out with pretty much anybody. Um, so <laughs> I'm... Uh, you know, I surround myself with people that know things that I don't know and pursue, you know, experiences with people that I, that know things that I don't know. And so um, I wanted to start this channel because I wanted to talk about something that really excited me. And that's where you see my intro video. And I'm sure you check, you caught on my intro video because it seems like you did. Uh, yeah. it, there was a lot of Eastern philosophy influences in it. So, um, yeah, I'm really excited about talking about Eastern philosophy. It's one of the first things that I want to talk about. I also want to talk about my adventures with martial arts and why I think that people who are liberty-oriented should learn martial arts um, because I think that it does a lot of really great things for independence. And it's not just being able to protect yourself. Honestly, right. it's it's so important. Right, yeah, it's a, it's a mental um, challenge. And uh, if you can you know, open your mind up to, uh, well, at least a new idea, but you, uh, it teaches you to uh, become whole, I suppose. And, but that's a simplified version of it. Uh, can you go into that a little bit? Well, one of the big reasons why it's good for any individual to study um, martial arts in particular is because um, it it promotes the concept of meditation. And this is just one of the many things, one of the great benefits of martial arts. So it promotes meditation. You have to meditate in order to be able to understand the art at all, to grasp anything. Because it's not just going through the motions. If you go through the motions, you're never going to learn the art because it's an internal feeling and an understanding of your body. If you don't understand how your body works, you're not going to get any of the moves. And you, you can do as many cool moves as you want, but you're not actually going to be able to defend yourself when it comes down to it. So you have to meditate. Now, one of the benefits of meditation is that when you finally free yourself, when you wake up, um, you realize that a lot of people have been lying to you for a really, really, really long time. And they've been telling you all these falsities. And meditation gives you not only the strength of mind to be able to handle that, but also the knowledge of yourself that comes with spending so much quiet time with yourself because it really, when you meditate, you are all alone in there. And it really just instills a kind of independence that no book and no you know, study of any Western philosophy is ever going to instill in you. Or even any study of Eastern philosophy. You can't study this. This is something that you need. You need to be able to close yourself off to the rest of the world for a little while and think about, you know, your internals and also shut off, you know, the thinking and just listen to the world around you. It will bring you the kind of knowledge that you can't discover through words. There is plenty of knowledge that is wordless out there and it is beautiful and amazing and I encourage you to really explore just take a beautiful walk through nature sometime and don't think about it just walk and it's uh, you learn so much it's incredible yeah I highly agree with that um, I I love the idea of nature in general uh, it, nature just goes hand in hand with liberty anyway um, I can't even describe that um, I actually the other night I was about to fall asleep and I wasn't trying to but I you know I just laid there and I just started thinking about um, literally light um, and it, I, you know you're not really thinking about it but how fast it goes and you know it, can you imagine if you were to ride a light wave you'd be traveling to the Sun in a heartbeat and beyond that you know like 
can you imagine traveling at that speed? You know, just something simple like that, you know, that that's um, in a sense liberating. I mean, it's not exactly what you're talking about, but you know, it's it's along the same path. Well, I think um, it's amazing how like it's so difficult for the mind to grasp something that moves at that kind of speed. I mean, yeah. how can you grasp something that's too fast for you to even see? We know it exists, but it's I totally get what you're saying. I mean, it's so fascinating. The world is incredibly fascinating. Um, right, right. And so, you know, all these people spend all this time, especially, you know, libertarians, they spend a lot of time arguing with one another and trying to be right about things instead of, you know, spending some quiet time. And I've spent a lot more quiet time lately because I feel like my channel will be a lot better if I take the time to make videos instead of just make a video once a week because I promised I would. Instead, I spend the time and the energy on actually conceptualizing these things for myself and integrating them into my life. And then I'm able to say, not only do have I read the books and you know really thought about it, but I've also integrated it into my life, and here's what I came out with. Right. So it's just so much more valuable to people. Right. I think that this will be a really unique channel in that way because there's not going to be a stone that I leave unturned. I mean, I'm going to study the Communist Manifesto to, you know, um, the Bolshevik Revolution. I mean, I'm going to study everything. I just want to know everything and just tell everybody about everything. And I just think that it'll be luck. So that's why I started it. That's the great thing. Like, if you uh, start to grasp these ideas and then you spit them out, other people are going to listen. And so basically, you're passing on that knowledge. And so I'm glad that you have these shows, and uh, because people are listening and people do value that. And when you, uh, you, it's not just about the knowledge. You, you know, that's the part that you like. But when you spit it out, you're you're doing a service to other people. So wonderful stuff, good stuff. Um, also, um, uh, so I just want to jump topics real quick um, because. Uh, I wanted to talk actually about uh, back to the objective morality, subjective morality, because um, if you think about it, may, tell me if this makes sense. Does uh, what you know kind of, is there a balance between objectivism and subjectivism? Is there, um, are you leaning more toward one or the other, or do you find value in both ideas? I guess that's my question. In objectivism and subjectivism? Yes, yeah. yeah only for the fact that, um, you know, there, I'm not saying that um, it's moral to do as you will all the time. I'm not saying that. I'm, I'm also, I, I'm kind of combining both of these ideas, I suppose, because if, basically, if you can uh, keep, you know, your mitts off of other people's stuff and that kind of thing, um, otherwise do as you will, then basically that's morality. Is that correct, or am I simplifying it too much? I would kind of say you're simplifying it a little too much. Of um, I, I, I can see a lot of value in the non-aggression principle, but you have to remember that objectivism isn't really about your relation to other people. So a lot of people try and compare anarchism and objectivism and this is why I've explained to a lot of people that they can coexist because they cover completely different realms. While uh, Ayn Rand did go over government's role in your life, it was about your life, not your, you know, your relation to society or your relation to government. So it was, <clears throat> it was about getting them out of your lives and while she didn't go far enough, it was really about their relation to you, not your relation to them. And so <clears throat> objectivism is about you personally. And while it doesn't go as deep as Eastern philosophies do, it's about your relation, um, about how you are able to deal with other people in a productive way for you. And so um, <clears throat> it's about personal development and about, um, you know, developing a life that you want to live and so you can't live subjectively because you're never going to find objective happiness um, you may be happy for short periods of time but it's not real you faked reality and you can never be a person of integrity and live a life of integrity when you 
when you deceive reality and evade reality. Because as Ayn Rand put it, you can ignore gravity, but you can't ignore the effects of gravity. Right, so, right. Uh, you know, you can't live on subjective whims alone, and you s actually can't really live on them at all. Um, the more that you ignore subjectivism and ignore your feelings and opinions and things, and I, while they are things that you're going to have, the more you overcome those kinds of biases and those kind of um, separating mechanisms, you'll see that we all live in an objective reality and we all pretty much are based on the same principles. We're human, so we function a certain way. Um, and so the more you let go of, of those different perceptions that you have and ignore that you know you feel a certain way and don't turn it into action. It's okay to feel a certain way, but don't turn it into action. Your action should be based on objectivism. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Right, right. If you're going to take an action, it needs to be based on reality. And so therefore, living... Living physically as a subjectivist is never going to be rewarding. Right, right. Okay. Um, yeah, so also um, I, I wanted to talk or jump right into um, uh, the news, as it were, or what's going on in the world with Russia and China. And, you know, it, it's just, uh, it's a, to put it bluntly, it's a shit show, okay? Um, because what's going on is the dollar will be collapsing, in my opinion, pretty soon. Um, all because a few years actually. Baltic Index. If you're interested, there's a. Uh, I just did uh, an episode on the Baltic Index, the Baltic Dry Index, and uh, it's a very good index for measuring the um, the world's economy. So it's not just the U.S. economy, but the entire world economy will collapse within the next two months to two years. Oh, yeah, absolutely, surely, because um, all I'm seeing is, well, right now, um, it, it, actually, let me go over the currency prices right now. The last time I did this show uh, was uh, February 2nd. Um, tonight is uh, February 9th. Uh, this goes live uh, February 11th, uh, so I took the prices tonight at 555 uh, silver has gone from 1718 to 1699. That's a 19 cent drop. That's 1.1 percent. Gold has gone from 1273.07 to 1238.40. That's 34 dollars 67 cents. That's 2.7 percent. And Bitcoin has gone from 273.32 to 220.95. That's 52 dollars 37 cents down. That's 19.2 percent. It's going down. All, all of these prices. So that means the value of the dollar is going up. But um, you know, it, it's going to stop at some point, and the dollar will drop. All the prices will rise, and we're, this will go for oil. This will go for food. This will go for pretty much every commodity that the, there is. Um, and well, you know why that is, right? Yes, exactly. It's all because there's it's a currency war right it's now. Right. It looks like it's going up. It's it's actually not. So the dollar is inflating, which is bringing the value down. But we don't see that because, first of all, um, mostly the petrodollar. Um, the petrodollar is holding up the um, the entire U.S. currency. It's yeah. a complete facade. Yeah. Um, and because the whole world must trade for oil in US dollars. Oh, yeah. There are huge stores of it across um, the ocean and across, you know, everywhere in the world. Um, and so because so much currency is be ha being held across borders, we don't see that inflation here at home as much because it's spread out over such a large area of, you know, the earth. And so you know, it's not actually the dollar's not doing well. Like everybody that thinks that the dollar is doing well is ignoring and doesn't know about the petrodollar. So they either don't know about the petrodollar or they don't understand the importance of the petrodollar. It's it's literally the only reason that our economy didn't collapse ten years ago. So and that's where Russia and China come in, don't they? Exactly. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um so Russia and China are um, 
Russia has long been trying to edge out the petrodollar. They don't like it. I mean, they're a superpower too. So, you know, superpowers are like, you know, a, like five-year-old children. Um, you know, they, both, they both want the blocks. And so, you know, and the U.S. has the blocks right now. And so Russia wants the blocks and is basically going to knock over all the blocks just so that it can get the block that it wants at the bottom instead of <laughs> the top. And so the, what I'm saying is, and the metaphor I'm using is, is that Russia beating down the petrodollar is hurting Russia too. So it's, it's really funny because it's, they're actually ruining their own currency trying to destroy the U.S.'s currency. And so it's, it's really funny and um, Russia and China are teaming up to try and get rid of the petrodollar because the Russian economy just had a huge crash. Um, but the thing is, is that the Russian economy is not as bad as they're saying it is. It's only $250 million in debt, which is not really that bad. Um, they have huge stores of it and will get through. Um, and they have a lot of natural resources that they're going to be able to get through the entire crisis with. In fact, they've been talking about giving a loan to Greece. I mean, they're doing so well they can give loans to Greece. <laughs> you know, and so maybe they can give a loan to me. Anyway, so... <laughs> That would be one nice loan. <laughs> and so I'm thinking like at least like two billion. That would be great. So <laughs> um, so the point is is that um, Russia's economy collapsed and the US because they're you know five year olds with the blocks, um, they're just kinda like na 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 na. But the thing is is that the US um, is their media our media is, no, well, not our media, that's not my media, um, but <laughs> the media outlets in the U.S. Right. Are, um, are basically over-dramatizing the collapse in Russia, and so Russia is peeved about it. And so, basically, we're looking at a second Cold War. Right. And with the amount of countries, six and growing every day, um, well, not every day, but might as well be. Uh, six countries that we are at war with um, right now. Right. Uh, Ukraine, Syria, Pakistan. Afghan. Oh, mm -hmm. there's yeah. several. Anyway, so um, several countries that we're at war with. I named all of them in my last video. Um, uh, the uh, transfer of power hour, if you guys are interested. But uh, where I talk about nothing but geopolitics. Um, so, anyway, they're just, you know, exaggerating this entire thing, irritating Russia, and we're already at war with all of these other countries, so you are literally looking at the next World War. Right. Get ready for World War III, and it will be the U.S.'s fault. Oh, yeah. Well, it doesn't matter whose fault it is. It's all... Well, it'll be the first time that it's the U.S.'s fault. So it'll be, you know, noteworthy, I guess. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Not that the U.S. didn't manipulate its people into being on board with getting into every world war. Note Lusitania and Pearl Harbor and, um, you know, the war, the Civil War was about, quote-unquote, slavery, but it actually wasn't. And it was about trying to manipulate the um, South into doing what the president wanted and him showing his big executive order you know, built. Yeah, right. <laughs> so uh, I think that, uh, you know, the Russia collapsed its currency on purpose, but not really a big collapse, like you said. It, w it wasn't a torrential collapse. Oh, you think they did it on purpose? Yeah, of course, if you think about it, because if they can collapse or will collapse their currency in order to, you know, collapse our currency, and then, then, uh, China and Russia create their own currency. That's what they're doing. Like, you know, they're trying to get out of the petrodollar. You said it, um, and uh, it's true. I if you think they're trying to create their own currency. I think they're trying to gather their resources together in order to be able to buy gold and invest in gold and be able to overpower the U.S. Oh, they are investing in gold, absolutely, uh, and right. they're... I don't uh, especially think China. A, a collapse would be particularly strategic for Russia. 
Well, I, I'm, I'm, I just the step that was missing in the explanation was what the collapse would do for Russia, and so. But what, what do you think would make them want to collapse? I'm, I'm just curious. Right, right. So um, if you if they collapse their own currency, uh, they strengthen the dollar, which makes exports, from what I understand, difficult or uh, more expensive um, for us. And and then that would uh, create uh, inflation over here uh, because they're gonna because they would consider that deflation on our side. So the central bank would pump up the currency, thus inflating, and that's what's going on. And uh, once people drop the dollar because of the inflation, it would cause a massive inflation on our side and collapse our currency, and therefore collapse the whole world. That's the theory. Interesting. I'm yeah. going to run this theory by uh, my friend Jason Brack. I, uh, I haven't heard this theory. Um, we've talked about it several times. He's a geopolitics complete guru. I mean, the man is a complete genius when it comes to economics and, and geopolitics. Um, but um, I uh, I will run this by him. I um, Yeah, because oh, I don't have, I have, just affects us. Order, but I, I'm not sure. So I, yeah. I'm not sure I'm buying it. So. Well, it's an interesting theory. Well, it, you know, it wouldn't just affect us because there are um, other people inflating their currency as well, like uh, Japan. They're, high, well, I'm not going to say hyperinflating, but uh, they did seriously inflate their currency over the last uh, two, three months. Um, and you don't think it's just so that they're able to, I mean, they're just printing more currency, right? Quickly, oh, rapidly. You, you know what I'm saying? Just to get, you know, it's it, so that they can maintain power. Because most of the time, when you print money, it's an attempt to maintain power and mm. grow power. Um, right. And in all actuality, all it does is um, devalue the currency as a whole. But it allows the government to be able to buy things. Um, Continue with right. wars. Right. So you don't think it's just that they're you know, trying to... Well, why would Japan do that? Why Japan doesn't have a strong army anymore or whatever. Uh, they have no reason to have that uh, hyperinflation. Well, I'm not going to say hyperinflation, but it, it was a sudden burst of uh, currency. It's not like it was a gradual, you know, exponential. It was like a sudden jolt up and then more horizontal or something. Have you taken a look at their expenses? I haven't been studying Japan. Um, it's not one of the ones that I've been covering lately, um, mm -hmm. mainly because I've been a little distracted with uh, U.S. wars at the moment, but, um, you know, no. in, in general. But I should take a look at Japan. Have you taken a look at their government spending? No. Spending no. Option? Because no. If, if you follow the money, you can normally indicate where the problem lies. They may be trying to get out of some kind of problem um, that their people may or may not know. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd have to take a look at Japan. Yeah, I, I think that's valuable. I think we should. Um, yeah, uh, anyway, um, the idea is that eventually this is going to catch up to us. I mean, that's that was the whole premise of what we agree on. Uh, it's going to catch up to us. And yeah. What's that? Oh, yeah, yeah it is. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so and it's going else. to... <laughs> and everyone else. Because right. superpowers are inflating both of their currencies in order to have a juvenile war over whose currency gets to deal, gets to deal in oil. And that's, you know, literally... The, going to be the entire world's economic collapse, and it's going to be catastrophic and awful. And I think the big thing people need to be worrying about right now is prepping and preparing for the economic collapse. Yeah. Because it's going to be worse 
because it's not just going to be a U.S. collapse. It's going to be a world collapse because we've been able to hold out. I'm sorry, the U.S. government has been <laughs> able to hold out. Um, not only have they prevented us from being able to um, invest in other currencies and use other currencies with business so that they can earn currencies that are valuable, um, which is unfortunate um, because all those hardworking people, none of their money is going to be worth anything. Um, in you know, it'll be worth fuel for the fire, like in Germany. They burned all their money just to stay warm. So it'll be worse because it'll be a global collapse, and so nobody will have any money. Um, and luckily, um, I think that people are smart enough and innovative enough that I think they'll be able to um, learn how to grow their own food and, and trade and um, be okay. But, you know, that's one of the things. People need to start learning a really good skill so they'll have something to trade because they're not going to have currency very, very soon. Right. Right. I, um, I highly suggest uh, gold and silver. I mean, to be blunt, uh, it's objective. <laughs> it's a real thing. It's a piece of metal, you know, and personally, I mean, I see the value in Bitcoin, of course, uh, but um, we've seen the value of that drop quite a bit. And of course, gold and silver, but even more so with Bitcoin. So you need to that's just a money. That, I'm sorry? You need to remember that most people don't realize that the economy is going to collapse, mainly because we've been crying economy collapse for like 10 years now. So really? people are like, you know, the economy is not going to collapse, you crazy people. But the Baltic Dry Index is actually a really good index and a good measure. And I've, I've known that the economy was going to collapse, but if, if the petrodollar, what you need to watch is the state of the petrodollar. If the petrodollar disappears or there is any indication that it will disappear, you need to shove all your money into anything you can. And Bitcoin is very cheap. And you need to remember that though Bitcoin is on sale right now, <laughs> that yeah. it will go way, way up yeah. in value when the economy collapses. Um, right. So its its value is determined by the market demand. And yeah. so um, it's valuable to invest in it because we're not going to have U.S. currency or any other currency for that matter. So, you know, while it may not look promising right now, um, it's going to be extremely valuable. And... Mm -hmm. You should buy it, and I've been stocking up. So yeah, like, like the apocalypse is coming. So. <laughs> it's it true. Is. I don't want to laugh, but it's true. You know, like um, what you're, what I'm doing is buying rice. I mean, that's all I've got right now for you know stable food or you know. Uh, rice is a good uh, one. Beans are good too. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. I'm gonna know how to uh, save meat. You should become paleo. Um, I have a whole, there's, there's a guy named Matt Phillips, and he gave a talk, and I work with him, he's one of my co-workers, um, he, um, gave a talk called Paleo versus the State at last, at last Pork Fest, mm -hmm. and it was a great talk, and you should go look up the video online, um, I think it's up, but he is so incredibly, um, knowledgeable and becoming paleo completely separates you from the kind of issues um, that you face with the state um, and also it can make you entirely independent because you'll just grow your own food and you don't have to live you quickly become adjusted to not eating carbs anymore it takes like three months and then you feel totally normal and you don't crave them anymore you're not interested in them anymore and as soon as you have them you feel like crap so um you know if you can stick with paleo for like three months it'll be the best change that you ever made in your life and um, trust somebody that knows I lost almost 15 pounds now wow. on paleo um, between that and martial arts so, yeah, I would suggest to anybody that you should go on paleo, not only because it makes you healthier and more energetic, and it's a more natural lifestyle. Look at the Paleolithical era, which it's based on. They were a lot faster and a lot more awesome than we are today because we eat carbs, and they make our body slow and numb our minds, and the government wants us to eat as much of it as we possibly can because... That way we can all stay sedated and stupid. So um, well, it literally I'm, makes you stupid. I'm kind of curious because I love bread. I'm a 
I love pizza. Um, there's gluten you, you get free. It. There's gluten free options for all those things. There's so you can eat literally paleo anything. I eat paleo mac and cheese. I eat, I have paleo brownies sitting on the counter waiting for me for after this interview. Oh, okay. I adore yeah. chocolate. Okay, now you convince me. Yeah, you can eat anything paleo. It takes a little bit more time, but you feel so much better. It's the the reward with the cost. It's it's totally reward over cost. <laughs> you feel so much better. Awesome. I have, I love paleo mac and cheese. It's one of my favorite things. Um, and the brownies, I eat them probably at least three nights a week. So oh wow! I yeah, I'm happy about that then. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, do they have uh, Do they have paleo K cups? <laughs> I don't think. That'd be great. You know, you know, you're supposed to have as much um, coffee as you possibly can on paleo because you put <laughs> butter and coconut oil in your coffee, and that gets you fat adjusted, and then you're not as hungry anymore. Um, and so I love I love paleo people because whenever you go, I'm really hungry. They always say to you. Did you have enough fat today? If you didn't have enough fat today, then that would explain why you're hungry. You should eat more fat. <laughs> like, Word. Wow. That's funny. And fat, fat makes you skinny. It literally yeah. makes you skinny. It um, goes right through you, right? Um. Well, not exactly. So it um, it it makes you eat less, which makes your stomach smaller. And so as you eat less and less, um, because it doesn't, it doesn't. It doesn't sit in your stomach the same way as regular food, and so I'm, you know, I'm not a scientist, so I can't really explain it fully. But yeah. um, you know, it basically just makes you less hungry. You need far less of it. It's it's in meat. I mean, if you ever notice the difference between when you eat meat or when you eat carbs, and you look at like the difference in calories on them and how much less calories you need in order to feel full. Right. Um, in regards to meat, you're always going to notice that you're just you're way more satisfied with meat. It lasts longer, and yeah, carbs last, but they make you tired and slow. And I want to be able to run like a cheetah, so I don't really want to be slowed down by the things in my body. So it's, you know, no wonder they put it at the bottom of the food pyramid. They want you to eat more of that. That that makes sense. Too. And, and and there's a whole conspiracy theory around it and I, I you know I got I gotta say that they've got they've got some top nutritionists on this stuff and for some reason they've been so stupid that they couldn't figure out that the pyramid is actually supposed to go the other way it's, <laughs> supposed to, it's they've done it the complete opposite wow of it's supposed to be wow. that, that's that's her number one. Right. You want wow. as much fat as you possibly can. That's nuts. And I feel amazing. I've lost a ton of weight. I feel incredible. I've been on this diet for like six months, and I nothing. I, my um, I'm somebody that deals with thyroid disease, um, and so being able to have like be that energetic is amazing. My doctors don't even know what happened to me. Just, I, mean, <laughs> I just don't even need the doctor anymore. So. You know, I used to go to the doctor because I was sick all the time, and now my immune system is like, you know, whatever. I got um, the flu twice already this year. Um, wow. It's going around in New Hampshire. It's really bad. And I was through it in, like, there was one 24-hour one, um, and I really, it really wasn't that bad. Um, and then there was one three-day one. And I got to tell you, there was never a point where I thought to myself, you know, I if I needed to get up and do something, I couldn't. Right. Um, and that that was the difference, and I noticed that because if I had gotten sick before, it would have been a whole drama fest, and it would have been you know I can't get out of my bed. There's no way on earth I can do anything. Um, I can't even think. Um, and I bet I would have been asleep the whole time. But um, yeah, I really just does amazing things for your life. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, actually, you, you brought up uh, the idea of not getting sick, and I, I won't talk about it very long, but I do want to bring up the fact that I, myself, haven't gotten a vaccination uh, for a flu or anything in at least four years, mm -hmm. and I, I must have gotten the flu 
this this year, I think, probably uh, a couple months ago, and I think a couple years ago as well. And again, the, like you said, it, it went right through me. I, I didn't really feel much. Um, I The thing with me, if I know I'm getting sick, I stay home. <clears throat> I don't care uh, how many days I have to take off from work. Um, I just want it out of me quickly. So I'm not going to force my body to uh, stress. So I stay home. If I need to sleep the whole freaking day, I will. And <clears throat> so that's what I do. And what was this? A uh, couple couple months ago, I'm pretty sure, I stayed home. I, I was feeling really bad that one day. But it was one day. And then I felt better the next couple days. Thank God it was a weekend. Thank God. You know what I'm saying? So I know what you're saying. Mine was... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, all I'm saying is, you know, if I, uh, I always drink juice as much as I can uh, every day, though I've been forgetting over the past couple of weeks, but that's another story. But I drink cranberry juice, I sleep as much as I can, I uh, try to keep my mind active, and that's what I do. So, um, I, I am not, first off, I'm not going to be saying, hey, you have to, get a vaccination, otherwise go to jail, that kind of thing. That's well, off the table anyway. None of us stand for that. But right, none of us liberty lovers, right. But yeah. at the same time, I do know a lot of people that are pro-vac, uh, and they're like, they, they want me to get a vaccination, uh, whether I like it or not, otherwise I get thrown in jail, and that irks me because I know I'm taking good care of myself, and... I stay home anyway if I have to, you know, recover or something. So, yeah. I, and I don't care what kind of disease it is because my body theoretically will fight it off because it's a natural thing for a body to do is fight it off. You know, why instate that upon a healthy body if it will become even more healthy if it receives, you, you see what I'm saying? Well, I mean, I think that you make some valid points about people who try and force vaccination. Yeah. Um, people that do that are just very unimaginative people. There are so many, so many private ways to incentivize vaccination, such yeah. as schools, private schools, which all schools should be private, but, you know, we're <laughs> not going to get into that right this second. But... Right. Um, I know that was something you wanted to cover, but um, anyway, the, the point is is that um, private schools, which should be all of them, can say your child can't go to school here unless they vaccinate, which is fine because they're a private business and they can do whatever they want, um, and they should be allowed to do whatever they want, and there will be schools where unvaccinated children are accepted, and that will be, you know, the way it is, and um, so the thing is is that I do disagree with you, though, about um, vaccinations. Um, the flu vaccine is very different than all the other vaccines. So Absolutely. The flu vaccine is the top five vaccines that were prominent last year that most people got sick from. And they put a dead or almost dead virus into a vial and you get flu-like symptoms for about 24 hours and then you get better. Now, I would never personally get the flu vaccine because it's not very effective because there are over a billion different types of flus. Of right. flu strains. And yeah. you can't get the same one twice. Yes, your body will adjust to that. But also, you know, it's just... I mean, unless you're somebody like Pendulette who travels a lot, yeah, it would be beneficial for him to go ahead and get a flu vaccine um, because it protects him from at least five. And every year he gets five more. And so they add up. And, and yeah, it kind of sucks, but, like, it's not very helpful, but at least it protects him a little bit. Um and also, with your explanation that you hadn't got sick, or you, you felt better and hadn't got a vaccine for four years, do keep in mind that there's no actual data to um, explain how long these vaccines protect people. Um, so it could still, those, those vaccines could still be in your body protecting you. Um, and the flu vaccine, any strain that they inject in you, you're now immune to. So it actually did help you. So even if you yeah. get sick, um, you're not getting sick from those viruses, so think how many more times you could have gotten sick. Yeah. And also, um, 
your body reacts differently to each strain. So um, having the flu vaccine is not really going to help you with other strains. So if you get sick, um, it's really not about, you know, whether you got a vaccine or not. It's about how you treated your body in the in-between time, and that's why I advocate for paleo and protecting your body and building up your immune system. Yeah. Um, now, as far as what you stated about, um, you know, the body naturally being able to handle diseases, do you keep in mind that we all come from different climates and people travel, and so when you know, diseases are transported across different climates that originated in certain climates, the people that didn't originate in that climate are more susceptible to those sorts of things because they didn't, um, they're not used to that environment that it originally, it, that it originated in. That's so, very true. Yeah. you know, it's very important that people keep in mind that well vaccines are not perfect, um, and they certainly are not. Um, they are the best option that we have right now. I would push the free market to try and come up with a better solution than vaccines, be only because I would like to see people healthier. But, um, you know, for now, I would suggest everything except for the flu vaccine, unless you're somebody that travels a lot and shakes a lot of hands and kisses a lot of babies like a politician. Then, well, you know, I hope they get the flu anyway. So. <laughs> um, no, the, you put up some great points, of course. Uh, you know, there's... You have to do your own personal research is what I'm kind of getting at. That's all I'm trying to say. Um, you know, each individual is different. And, yes, uh, there are going to be new things introduced into a new continent, blah, 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 and that kind of thing, um, especially um, the, I guess what I'm trying to get at uh, with the Ebola thing is that was overdone, uh, though. Oh, it was. Uh, it was overdone. Uh, I'm, uh, what I mean is uh, it was blown up in the news. Um, there were only a few people that were uh, affected and transported over here and when they theoretically should have been quarantined, but then again, I'm against freedom, uh, against you know jailing people over that kind of thing. So I, whatever. I guess my point is you have to do your own personal research and listen to... Um, what your gut is telling you, and you know, be logical at the same time. So, and that, and keep in mind that they have, whether intentionally or unintentionally, um, exaggerated the effects of Ebola because there was an individual that actually did recover from Ebola. Um, right. So, and he actually attacked Chris Christie, which was hilarious, <laughs> but um, for, his vaccina for his vaccination stance. Um, mm. But, you know, I, I only think it's really funny because it's a politician, and I just love watching them get beat up. It's hilarious. Uh, he didn't physically hurt him. He just verbally loved him, which I'm totally for. That's not aggression. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, I love when people verbally beat other people up when they're politicians. Mm. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> anyway, the, the point is, is that, um, you know, the, the government does tend to over-exaggerate things, but, you know, I people tend to over-exaggerate things. Everybody's like, oh, my God, my life is over because I had a breakup or something. And I get it. Like, that was a very valuable part of your life, but you need to keep in mind that you have a humongous life. <laughs> like, you probably not think one event in your life is, like, the pivotal moment in your life. Um so especially when it's a relationship with another human being because your relationship with yourself is far more important than your relationship with any other human So which is, you know, why I study Eastern philosophy and why I've been studying Taoism and why I love Taoism. So um, it's a great complement to uh, objectivism and anarchism. So, um, I feel like everybody should be studying both Eastern and Western philosophies because Western philosophies teach you to how what you should be expecting out of your life um, in regards to other people and your relationship to other people. And Eastern philosophy teaches you what you should be expecting from yourself and how to control your body and how to give it the right nutrition and how to um, know when it's telling you, you know, that it needs nutrition and um, also how to move and breathe correctly and just, you know, 
the internal workings of the human mind. And if you want to become a better person, um, which I think everybody should want that every single day, I'm somebody that strives for excellence every day. And if you want that, then you need to understand Eastern philosophy. And I would suggest not only meditation, but also um, martial arts. So. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, would you like to go over um, where we can find you, uh, what your website is, and all that kind of thing? Absolutely. So, um, of course, you can go to objectivistgirl.com. It is still up. It always will be. Um, it'll be a hub for people to be able to learn the philosophy. I think it's so valuable, um, especially for people who don't know much about liberty. But honestly, if you want to go into business, it's it's recommended as one of the number one business books by some of the greatest entrepreneurs in the world, including Mark Cuban. So, Mark Cuban. Um, is a huge libertarian and recommends um, the Fountainhead for for business and Atlas Shrugged as well, but mostly the Fountainhead, um, which is great because Fountainhead's awesome. Um, but yeah, it's his number one book on his list, and so objectivism is a great philosophy for anybody that wants to start a business or just wants to have more success in their relationships with other people. It it really helps you be able to have a relationship with other people that's more constructive. So go to objectivistgirl.com, scroll through the videos, learn all that you possibly can because it's there. It's right there. I lined it all out for you. There's like maybe three hours of content. You can learn everything you need to know about objectivism in just like three hours. And that's so valuable. And so um, also there's laurenrumpler.com, which is a hub for all of my shows, including... Um, uh, Lauren Rumpler, everything Lauren Rumpler Productions, which is what my YouTube channel is. It's youtube.com slash Lauren Rumpler, and um, you will find my intro to my channel and my interview with Pendulette about vaccination, as well as my interview with Mark Korski about engines of domination. Um, it's a great review for Engines of Domination. I thought it was a great piece, but there were I was left with a lot of questions, and I think he really answered those questions very well. Um, there was a lot of, is he a communist going on in my head, but it turns out he's not, So um, and he's into Taoism, so check out that. You know, we talked about that for a little bit. Um, and so um, then uh, there's my show, The Transfer of Power Hour, um, which is my geopolitics show that is on at 6.30 p.m. on Fridays. Um, check out facebook.com slash Lauren Ruffler Productions for that. Um, and you really can find everything at facebook.com slash Lauren Ruffler Productions. That's the only place you really need to go. But um, And then there's my True Objective show, which I do with... Um, with Calvin Thompson, a great friend of mine. He's so knowledgeable on everything regarding history. It's ridiculous. The guy knows everything. And he's just got the cutest personality. Um, and so that's my podcast, and that's a weekly podcast at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on um, on uh, JREV Radio. And uh, we do a Google Hangout for that as well if you want to, like, watch us. And then I, you know, release it after that on iTunes and Stitcher. Um, and so, yeah, pretty much just go to Facebook.com slash Lauren Ruffler Productions and like the page and click Get Notifications. And you will never miss anything that I ever do. Ever. Oh. Put it all there. There you go. You heard it first. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, thank you very much, Lauren. Uh, it was a pleasure, honestly. I had a blast. Thank you. I I get to some of the things I never get to talk about, so that's exciting. That's awesome. Yeah, I uh, we don't talk about morality much on the show anymore. Um, so uh, my co-host uh, is not a objectivist, and I I don't know where I stand anymore. I'm kind of in the middle at the moment, so. But this was very constructive. I love this show. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, the next show will be uh, February 16th, live on this channel right here. This show will be out uh, February 11th. Uh, same channel, Cur of Anarchy. And uh, the next show will be with Eric Bell. Uh, he'll, he had me and Michael on his show uh, in the past. And he'll be coming on this show, so uh, stay tuned for that. And uh, thank you all for watching. Take care.